Bonnie and Bob won't Would you please stand? We're going to sing House of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I welcome you to Worship Under the Tent. What a beautiful last Sunday we have uh, under the tent here. Uh, just a reminder that next week we will be back inside uh, and we'll be back to kind of our normal uh, schedule. So we'll have our worship time will be at 11 o'clock and then we have Sunday school before that from 9.30 uh, to 10.30. So that is uh, next week. This week, is going to be a crazy busy week. We got a lot of kids coming. We're excited about our uh, VBS, annual VBS uh, week. So, right after our uh, service, we are going to be uh, needing uh, help in setting up. So, we're going to meet at the garage back there. Okay, we'll feed you, um, but we're going to need to transform the inside. We got, we're going to decorate this. We got a lot of work to do. So, if you could help us with that, we would greatly uh, appreciate uh, that. Uh, announcement here for uh, youth. Uh, this week we're going to be at the Kaufman's house. We're going to have a pool party, so we're meeting here at uh, 6 o'clock. So if you are middle school or high school, we invite you to come join us uh, for that. Then also a reminder, we have our praise in the park. That's going to be downtown Rockford, down by the, the river there. They got a nice new uh, pavilion there that uh, we're just looking forward to being able to uh, sing 
uh, praise and worship uh, down there. So mark that on your calendar. It's going to be a great event for the whole family. We'll have popcorn, snow cones. Just come and join us for fellowship. And it's nice to have people from the community down there just hearing um, uh, worship. I'm going to ask Scott. He's going to come up and uh, make an announcement for us about our men's Bible study on uh, Thursdays. I'm going to grab one of their, their mics up there. Before Scott does Maybe this. everybody can hear me. I can no. talk loud. Mike will be good, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'll Yeah. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, on Thursday afternoon, well, evening, 5.15, we've been having a men's Bible study. We're in First Peter. Uh, Pastor Tim is leading that group. And um, I just want to put out an invitation to all you guys. Uh, it's only an hour long. Uh, Tim comes up with questions and uh, we run through and we've been moving pretty slow but that's we're, it, we're slow and deliberate <laughs> so we're we're studying the word really closely and uh, we're taking it apart and we're taking things out of that uh, that we can use in our everyday lives so uh, like I said Thursday 515 uh, you don't have to uh, if you want to just come and absorb you can do that you don't have to say anything we're not going to put you on the spot or anything like that so uh hope to see some of you guys there all Thanks. right thank you scott appreciate that I'll give that to greg and then one last announcement here we are going to have our special uh baptism uh service is going to be at uh, pine ridge so mark your calendars for that that is going to be on sunday august uh, 20th and if you're interested in being baptized you can come in and talk with me we have a couple so far that are interested but that's just a glorious uh, time a celebration a great service that we have out at uh, uh, pine ridge and i just heard one more thing um we have uh ray win i heard you are a citizen this last week correct almost okay all right Let's give her a round of applause i know that can be a very long process um, but we're thankful uh, for that. Other announcements are in the bulletin here. I'm just going to uh, pray and ask God's blessing on our time. Lord, we are so thankful just for this beautiful weather, for this uh, time together. And as we're going to look at uh, First John, uh, we're just going to see the uh, glorious fellowship that we can have together as uh, believers. And that is because of the relationship that you offer through your son, Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. And we're thankful to... Have joy, true joy in fellowship with you and also with other believers. And we're thankful, especially the world in which we live, where it just seems like so few have true uh, joy. But we are thankful for that. And I just pray that this morning we would just be joyous in our worship. And as we uh, dig into your word, uh, just this would be a glorifying uh, time. And as always, everything that we would do would be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. This morning, the theme is about grace. The Bible tells us in Ephesians that we are saved by grace through faith, and that, not of yourselves, is a gift of God. So I really hope that you kind of embrace that theme as we sing our first song, Your Grace is Enough. Would you please stand? Thank you. 
before the message about grace. I don't know if you know this one. You do feel free to um, sing along. It's called Scandal of Grace. Some of the words may seem a little bit different uh, in terms of how you've sung about grace before, but if you can think about it, it's probably pretty solid. Let's pray. Great, awesome, heavenly Father, our eternal God, I thank you so much for your promise, Lord, the promise that you are going to come again. I thank you, heavenly Father, that even though as we look around, we see the evil in this world, you will come again. And I, I long to hear those words. Behold, I make everything new. Oh, Lord, we, uh, we just pain for your coming. We, we pray, Lord, that you would come again soon. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given us to pray to you. Were it not for the blood of Jesus Christ, that he shed on the cross, and were it not for that sacrifice that he made, we could not be made holy. We could not come to you in prayer. We would not have that right. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done for us. 
Now, Lord, there's uh, things in our congregation that we need to bring to your attention again. Lord, we know that you see all things. I would just ask you for Silas, um, Mike's grandson, that, Lord, he's in dire straits right now. They're, they're concerned whether he's going to live. And, Lord, we know that you love him, and I just pray, Heavenly Father, that um, that you would do your will there. We pray that you would revive his body and strengthen him and bring him back to strength again. Lord, we thank you also, too, for Kim, who has um, um, been spared having to have open-heart surgery, and I just pray that you continue to bless her and help her. Bring before you again Pat, Lord, we um, Thank you for uh, the results of his test. I pray that you continue to bring strength to his body. We remember Jim Devereaux now, who is in the hospital right now um, because of possible heart problems. We really don't even know for sure what's going on there. So I just pray for Jim and Sandy that you would bless them and watch over them and give them the desires of their heart, Lord. I pray for Steve and Jean, that after Jean's fall and her broken back, Lord, that she would... Um, just be strengthened. I pray for healing every day and for Steve too as he has his test next Wednesday or his uh, he had his test last Wednesday and he goes to see the doctor this coming Wednesday that Lord they would um, uh, be able to determine uh, the location of the cancer and a, and a quick and easy um, treatment for it. Lord we just pray for all of our cancer victims that you would help them and bless them and give them the desires of their heart and, and just keep them, uh, make them strong, Lord. I pray, Heavenly Father, uh, for Israel, your people, Lord. I pray that you would, um, I know that someday you will rule from there on this earth, and I just pray for your people. I pray your blessings on them. I pray for the nation that we live in, Lord. The evil that we see around us, I just ask you, Lord, that you would bring us righteous leaders. Now I ask you, Lord, as our uh, as Pastor Justin comes to bring the sermon, that you would uh, just give him your unction and 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 blessing. I pray, Father, that uh, uh, we would be attentive to your word, and I pray, Father, that your word would bless our hearts. Now in Jesus' name, I pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Al. Would like to invite you to open your Bibles to First uh, John. First John, it's all the way there towards uh, the end of the back of your Bibles, and we started a new series that I'm really excited about called "Living with Certainty." Living with certainty, and we were challenged with John's words that last week we can have assurance that we are saved. So that's a theme that we're going to see throughout this book. And John is writing this letter to help us identify the signs that the gospel is true and that your experience with God is truly genuine. Remember last week I mentioned a verse, a key verse, if you want to highlight this, it's 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can have a confidence and assurance in that. And that's a theme that we see all throughout the book. And we answered a couple of questions last week. The first was, does God even want us to know that we are saved? And we kind of went through and dissected that. And the answer is a resounding yes, he does. And then we looked at how we can know and have that confidence. And I gave us a little bit of context about the book. John was an apostle, one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. And at the time of this writing, John was probably the only surviving member of the Twelve. And he wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote First and Second, Third John, and then he also wrote Revelation. And he wrote this letter to the churches of Asia Minor probably between A.D. 80 and 85. And the church was now composed of second and third generation believers, Christians. And for some Christians, this was a time of persecution. For others, perhaps the thrill was gone, the flame of devotion of Christ was waning, was flickering, and they just needed some encouragement. 
We also know as today there were some false teachers that were there in some of the churches and some Christians were becoming lax in their standards and it was into these circumstances that John steps in and writes this letter. So a question I want us to look at today is how do you know that your experience with God is genuine? How do you know that? And John has several points he makes in answering this question. And he makes them over and over, and they're in no particular order. If, you were the, if we had the Apostle Paul writing this book, it would be very orderly and, and logical. It would be point one, point two, point three. But John is kind of all over the map. He's like, hey, point one we're going to have first, then point two, and then we're going to go to part of point four, and then back to point two, and now for the first part of point three, more about point one. And for some of us, that might drive you crazy. But it's just a jumble of points, which makes 1 John a little challenging for me as I was studying it to teach. So today we're going to be talking about gaining certainty about Jesus through an experience with him. So 1 John chapter 1, we're going to look at the first three verses as we start here. He writes, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He says the life has appeared, we've seen it, we can testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So John starts by saying that which was from the beginning. Now you notice the heading over the top of these verses in your Bibles probably says the word of life. And John's referring to Jesus Christ as the word of life. And that's one of John's favorite descriptors for Jesus is the word. If you're in Awana, you grew up, John 1 says, In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Now when John says that Jesus was from the beginning... The question we ask is, which beginning is he talking about? Is this the beginning of Jesus' earthly life, or perhaps the beginning of all creation? Jesus' existence did not begin, we know, when he was born in Bethlehem. We know Jesus was not created being like the angels before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This beginning that John is referring to goes all the way back to eternity past I love how uh, Pastor R.G. Lee once described it this way. Now, you're really going to have to put on your thinking caps, okay? This is deep. He says, Jesus was the only man who had a heavenly father, but no heavenly mother. Who had an earthly mother, but no earthly father. Who was older than his mother, and who was as old as his father. You guys get that? All right. Yeah, you're like, wow, that's some pretty deep stuff there. But Jesus is full God. We know that he is eternal. And John is saying that the reason he's writing this is that he and the other apostles, they saw Jesus. They heard him. They were able to hug him. They saw his miracles. They felt his resurrected body. And you can imagine John writing this and saying something like, hey, what I heard from Jesus many years ago is still ringing in my ears as clear as a bell today as when I first heard it. What I saw many years ago when Jesus was on the earth is as clear and vivid to me today as it was then. It's as if John is saying, you know, we, don't, we didn't believe this because we thought Christianity was a superior way to live or, or it made the most sense. We practiced it because we had seen Christ rise from the dead. And you know what? The apostles never attempt to draw their authority from the fact that this was a superior explanation of the world. It may be a superior explanation of the world, but they draw their authority from the fact that Jesus was God who came down from heaven and was verified to them through the resurrection and through his many miraculous works. The proof for them was not in how wise Jesus' teaching struck them, but it was by his resurrection, by his miraculous power. A great example of this I love is in John's Gospel. He tells the story of a certain Jewish man who was blind from birth. Which to, Jew, to the Jews would have been a sign on this guy that this was God's judgment. You know, that's why you're blind. And Jesus goes and he heals him. And then the, the religious uh, Jewish leaders hear about it and they confront this guy. 
And they say, hey, there's no way this guy could have healed you, Jesus. He's, his teachings are wrong. We believe they're wrong. And you know what the formerly blind guy's response is? I love this. John chapter 9, verse 25. He says, hey, whether he's a sinner or not, I'll let you philosophers decide that. One thing I do know, you can't argue with this, I was blind, but now I see. All right? I heard a, uh, years ago at the pastor's conference, I heard a pastor, uh, J.D. Greer, say this. He says, faith equals the unexplainable meeting the undeniable. Faith equals the unexplainable, meaning the undeniable. And there are a lot of things about Christianity, I'll be honest, that are really hard to believe. And that's just not how a few fringe people of Christianity feel. That's how anyone who really dives deep into Christianity and takes it seriously will feel at times. I mean, Christian uh, claims will undoubtedly offend some people. They will leave us with some unanswered questions. People have all kinds of reasons today to why Jesus could not possibly be true. They think, man, his system of morality, that's just so offensive, Jesus. I mean, the problem of evil in the world, that's just way too great. How could God ever allow this to happen? But then you encounter the evidence for Jesus, like John did, and that challenges all of those assumptions. Think of it like this. This last week, for you uh, baseball fans, there was the Home Run Derby, there was the All-Star Game, and um, I was reading a book uh, this last week, and it's by Ye a Yale phys physicist, his name was Robert Adar, and he studied the science behind hitting a major league fastball. He published it in a book that came out in 2002 called The Physics of Baseball, and here's one of the things that he found. A 90 mile per hour, per hour fastball, it travels the 60 feet 6 inches from the pitcher's hand to the catcher's glove in 400 milliseconds. Can you believe that? That's a little less than half a second. And he figured it out. It takes the batter's brain 200 milliseconds to find the ball in the air. Get the image into his brain and then decide whether or not to swing. You think your job is difficult at times, trying to hit a fastball? So he says half the time the ball is in the air, the batter is simply trying to decide, should I swing or should I not? Well, if the batter decides to swing, this physicist says, the brain spends another 100 milliseconds deciding to swing the bat high, low, inside, or outside of the strike zone. So you're down to 300 milliseconds before you've ever swung. Now the swing itself, he says, takes 150 milliseconds. During the first 50, the batter can stop his swing. Beyond the 50 milliseconds, the bat is moving at 70% of its final speed, and he concludes it cannot be stopped. And this physicist says a 7 millisecond variation will cause the hitter to either hit a foul ball or miss the ball altogether. So 200 locating the ball, 100 making the decision, and 150 swinging the bat. So that's 450 milliseconds. But the ball is in the catcher's glove after 400 milliseconds. So Adar concludes that according to the law of physics, hitting a 90 mile an hour fastball is simply impossible. So how many of you would agree with that conclusion? Okay, a few would. John Wilson, he's our baseball guy, he says yes. But most of you say no. And why is that? Is it because you can prove him wrong in this or that calculation? No, you say. Well, I don't know where he's wrong, and I'm not sure about all this physics, but I've actually seen it happen. I've seen a guy hit a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. In fact, I've seen a guy hit a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. So 90 mile an hour is impossible, what about 100? You think, I can't explain all the facts, but also I can't deny what I've seen. So you are smart enough not to opt for the unexplainable over the undeniable. And John says this, it's not a theory we have accepted because we can explain it all. We believe this because we saw Jesus. He rose from the dead, we saw him, we touched him. We felt his wounds in his body and his resurrection. And 
by the way, before I move on, John's statement here also confronts one of the, mo one of the most commonly held assumptions that's in our culture today about religious truth. People often treat religion as if it were a subjective opinion. Immanuel Kant, the father of modern philosophy, who said essentially all religions are subjectively helpful, they are not all objectively true. Now, I had to really think about this. Do you know the difference between subjective and objective truth? Subjective, you could say it's really warm under this tent right now. I'm, I'm up here preaching. I'm thinking, man, it's getting kind of hot. Now, many of you could say, well, there's a nice breeze coming through here. I wouldn't say it's warm. I would think it was perfect. My mom probably has her sweater on, thinking it's a little chilly. Okay. So each of us, if you were to ask what the temperature is, you could say it's subjective. I don't know. It depends on who you ask, right? So that's subjective truth. Objective truth is this. Lansing is the capital of Michigan. Okay, there's no arguing over that. And our world wants to put Christianity in the realm of the subjective. We watch talk shows like Oprah and Ellen, and they want truth to be subjective. Whatever works for you is good. It's, it's really your preference. We want you to feel good in your skin. So whatever works for you is fine. But John, John says there was nothing subjective about the resurrection of Jesus. We actually got to see him when we got to touch him. Well, many today would say, well, yeah, John got to see Jesus. He got to hug him and touch him. Well, that would be great if I was there. But what good does that do for me today? I'm so glad you asked that question. Check out verse 3. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. That's John's goal here. And he says, and our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, and Jesus Christ. So you notice John mentions all of this so that we can have fellowship along with him. And he speaks of fellowship many different times throughout his letter. And the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Now, what do many, many of us think when we talk about fellowship? We think of like coffee fellowship, right? You get a coffee and a donut, and we talk to one another. But there's more to it than just that. John wants us to have the same experiential knowledge with God that he had. Well, you say, well, how, how do we do that? We haven't seen Jesus. I haven't talked to Jesus. Uh, how do, how, I haven't touched Jesus. The answer is in verse 2. It says, the life appeared. We've seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So the Jesus that John touched, the, the Jesus that, that had many miracles that the disciples observed were a manifestation of the life of God. It says a life that each one of us can share in. The fellowship that exists among the followers of Jesus we know is far richer than any college fraternity or a sorority. It's far richer than your love for your favorite sports team. It's far richer and deeper than even that of your national identity or your ethnic heritage. By the perfect atoning sacrifice of Christ, we are now a part in a fellowship of a family with each other, but most importantly, with his son, Jesus Christ, and with the Father. I find it interesting that the miracles Jesus did were all signs that pointed to a much greater reality. And I did a study uh, this last week, and I just looked at about four or five of his different miracles. And each one were great, weren't they? But they all pointed to a, a, a relationship that God wanted to have, a life that we could share in. For example, in John 6, Jesus multiplied bread. He fed 5,000. But he explained that this was a sign of God's power to truly satisfy. He was the bread of life. And those who come to him will find a soul satisfaction that only he can provide. Knowing him feels like a starving person sitting down to a seven-course meal, a, a buffet, and how joyous that would be. Have you ever felt that? It's the proof that God is real. St. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest 
in you. In John 4, Jesus tells a story about a woman who discovered that Jesus knew everything about her, all of her uh, dirty, dark secrets, but he loved her anyways, and she couldn't believe it. Have you ever had the sense of the love of God just pressing in on your soul, that sense that you are fully known, you are fully loved, no matter what your, your past is? In Mark 4, Jesus is out at the sea with his disciples. And remember, a terrible storm is raging all around him. And they're terrified. They wake him up and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus stands up, calmly says, quiet, be still to the waves. Has that ever happened to you? Either Jesus has actually stilled the storm that may be in your life, or even better, given you peace in the storm by showing you that it was all under his control during this terrible time in your life. In Matthew 9, a woman came to Jesus, and this woman had had a, a menstrual flow of blood for 12 years, which made her unclean, which meant no one would touch her. She was unlovable. She was an outcast. But Jesus calls her by the tenderest term, daughter. And her soul just fills with the awareness of the love of God for her. And we think of these many different examples, and they might have not happened that way for us. But have you ever heard that in your soul and felt that, that you are a child of God? In Mark 8, Jesus heals the blind guy. And I'm just fascinated by this. He does it really in two stages. In the first stage, he, he kind of clears up his vision a little bit, and the guy, they're asking him, and he says, you know what, my, my vision's still a little blurry. I see people walking around like they're, they're trees. Then Jesus touches him. And, and, and why did he do this? Were his batteries low the first time that he tried to heal this guy? You see, he was giving you a picture of how he clears up our spiritual vision. When he first comes into your life, you may see some basic spiritual truths. But the longer you walk with him, he explains more and more of the world to you. So has this ever happened to you? I hope you're getting the point here that koinonia, the, the fellowship that John is talking about, is an experiential word. And as you experience these things, you can gain greater confirmation that God is true, and we can believe and trust in him. Now, you notice in verse 2, it says in our NIV Bibles, the life appeared. If you have an English Standard Bible, that version translates it, the word of life is made manifest made manifest so jesus appeared he was made manifest he came to life and he can come alive and he can speak to us today also so if you're taking notes i want you to just write this down i'll say it two times write this down it says a genuine experience with god this fellowship this koinonia is the word of the gospel coming alive in your heart a genuine experience with God is the word of the gospel coming alive in your heart. And when we talk about this, this, this life that appeared, this manifestation that I talk about, I know that's fancy, but that was God coming, sending his son to us. It first happens to us at conversion. God's grace becomes real. And I remember hearing the testimony of John Wesley he became a Christian, and he described an evening where he went very reluctantly into a church on Eldersgate Street. Then his mom dragged him there. He did not want to be there. And this is what he said. It was about quarter past nine. The pastor was reading from Luther's preface to the epistle of the Romans. And as he described the change which God works in the heart through faith in Jesus Christ, he said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I saw that Christ had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And we see a genuine experience with God is the manifestation of the word of life into your heart. You begin to feel the word of life. The cross becomes larger. Your sins get more real. God's grace just gets sweeter and sweeter. The old words of life from God's word, they press into our hearts and they become new and alive to us. I like to think of it like one of those old magic eye pictures that were popular back in the 90s. If any of you are my age or even older, um, remember those, um, those things where you could go to the mall and there was these posters 
And I remember they're standing there next to my dad, and he would look at it, and he would say, Justin, do you see that? It's the Statue of Liberty popping out at me in 3D. And I'd be like, I don't see anything, Dad. I just see a bunch of little dots popping out at me. And I remember uh, the trick was you go really close, and then you kind of slowly go back, and then all of a sudden I remember that first time the joy when I figured it out. And that's similar when the Spirit of God makes the gospel real to you. It comes alive. It takes on death. The Puritan Thomas Goodwin said it was like a married couple that are walking along when suddenly the husband sweeps his girl up in his arms and he kisses her and tells her that he loves her. They were no less married before he did that, but her sense of his love is more real and felt in that moment. So my prayer this morning, and I'm sure John would agree, is that the gospel becomes 3D in each of our lives. It becomes personal. It's, it's working. And that shows the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. And this manifestation happens first at conversion, but it happens again and again through the rest of your life. There should be times when God's love just presses in on you. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays that the Ephesians would be able to grasp the height and the width and the depth of God's love for them. And I dug into this word grasp. Here in, in the Greek, it, it's a military word that means literally to seize or to overtake, as in overtake a fortress, to knock the walls down. And John's praying that the knowledge of the love of God would attack our hearts, would penetrate it. And I think of, uh, one word of caution of, of this is don't try to judge your experience by someone else's. Some of us, I know, are not as emotional as others. You might hear someone's testimony and think, hey, I... That's such a dramatic experience. I don't have that. Am, am I really saved? Sometimes it's not that dramatic for me, and sometimes God has worked in incredibly dramatic ways in my life. But the point is, is that true Christians have fellowship, have koinonia with God, where God makes the word of life and the beauty of God tangible for us and real. Now this leads to a practical question. You may ask, how can I experience moments of fellowship with God? Well, I'd say first of all, put yourself in the presence of the Word. John ties the activity of God to His Word. So maybe you're here this morning and you're not a, a believer, or if you are a Christian and you're trying to, to get a friend of yours to see the truth, my challenge to you is get them into the Word challenge I've had for the teens this summer is to read through the book of John. What a glorious book just to dig through. I think of Martin Luther. Martin Luther once said, the Bible is like a caged lion. If someone doesn't believe the lion is real, don't stand there and defend the lion verbally. Just open the cage. Right? So get them the word. Let them dig into it. And let God speak to them. Paul says in Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So dig into the Word of life. And if you're a believer, you need to put yourself in the presence of the Word daily. Have a quiet time. Memorize Scripture. Pray the Scriptures back to God. Worship on Sundays by singing, by hearing the Word. I think also just get involved throughout the week. There are many different things. Scott was saying we have a men's Bible study. We have women's Bible study. We have Bible study fellowship that meets here. We have life groups. So get in a, a Bible study throughout the week. But I want to encourage us as we end here, a final verse that he writes in verse 4 is why do I mention all this? He says, he writes this so that our joy may be complete. John speaks of joy in all three of his letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we know that Christian joy is far removed from what is commonly known as happiness, which can be often dependent on our outward circumstances. But he's saying Christian joy is much deeper. It's a much richer joy in meeting. Joy is the presence of Jesus in our lives. We know by having the Holy Spirit inside us. And as we looked at a couple weeks ago, we were studying through the book of Ecclesiastes. And you had the wisest and richest man who ever lived found out that only God can grant true joy to the human soil. 
Ben Solomon, whom the world had exhausted itself and for whom the world was not enough, discovered the bitter truth that at the end of every paycheck, the bottom of every bottle, and the morning after every one night stand, there was still an emptiness that was in his heart. And he couldn't find true joy. The crown of joy can only be worn by those who have been adopted into God's royal family through his son, Jesus Christ. I'd like us just to bow this morning. I want to encourage us to ask, do you really know him? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? And we might say, well, hi, great, the disciples got to see Jesus, but how can I have fellowship with him today? And I would encourage you to dig into the word and the challenge that Martin Luther said, to open up that cage and see, challenge God to, to really reveal himself to us through the word. We can have fellowship with him. That brings true joy, and we all know that it starts with the gospel, the gospel that Jesus Christ became. He lived a sinless life, and he died um, for our sins, and he died in our place. And we are so thankful for that, so that we can have a restored relationship with God the Father. So believe it, and we believe that God's word says that we can then enter into a fellowship with God, with, with Jesus Christ. And that we can have a fellowship with one another as believers that can bring true joy. And I pray that all this would start today in your life. I pray these things your name. Amen. The pre-chorus of the song we're about to sing is Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Would you please stand as we sing?
closing benediction is found in 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this week. Thank you. You are dismissed.